This is going to be a short recording about the initial discussion of the concept of the atom, the theory that developed the modern concept of the atom, and then major experiments that led to our current understanding of the structure of the atom. So oftentimes we throw out the term atom and people have a vague idea of what that means. And in our current understanding, we kind of think of atoms as the smallest neutral pieces of matter that have definitive chemical properties, right? It was explained to me when I was in high school as, say you have a lump of gold and you have an infinitely sharp knife and whatever you cut with this infinitely sharp knife will be cut in two. So you take your lump of gold and you cut it and you end up with two lumps of gold. And you keep doing this over and over and over again, getting a smaller and smaller and smaller piece of gold. Eventually you get to a piece of gold so small that if you were to take your infinitely sharp knife and cut it, you would still get smaller objects because the atom is not the smallest piece of matter, right? You would still get smaller objects, but they would no longer be gold. So that piece that you were about to cut, that little tiny thing that still had the properties of gold, that would be an atom of gold. Now visually how they look, and we can actually visualize atoms now using atomic force microscopy, atoms look like little kind of fuzzy spheres and they tend to stack together or link together into larger structures. So if you were to take the copper skin of the penny in the picture and you were to look down at the atomic level, you would see all these little spheres that represent copper atoms kind of stacked on top of each other in a very specific pattern that represents copper metal. Now, the first guy who comes up with a modern theory of the atom is an English school teacher, put that in quotes, because he was actually not just a school teacher, he was also a gentleman scientist who had other discoveries to his name. We're going to talk about one of his discoveries in the gas laws in chapter 8 named John Dalton. Now John Dalton publishes his work in 1807 um, under Dalton's atomic theory and there's a whole YouTube video under the chemistry heritage project that you can go look up. I've linked it in there but you can go look it up and see it. It's a really interesting little video about how he got to atomic structure from meteorology. Now Dalton's atomic theory puts forth five postulates. So what is a postulate? A postulate is basically a statement, an idea of how something works. So the five points of his model. Now the first point is he says matter is composed of exceedingly small particles called atoms. He's the one who actually gives them the name atoms. Now he gets the name atoms from a Greek word, but he's the one who actually calls them atoms. And like he says, he says they're the smallest unit of an element that can participate in chemical change. Now, all right, so what's an element? Well, at this point in chemistry, people knew that an element was the smallest thing that couldn't be subdivided, couldn't be broken down, right? So you had oxygen was an element because you couldn't break it down. Whereas water was not an element because you could break it down into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas with enough electricity, right? His second statement is an element consists of only one type of atom, which has a mass that's characteristic of that element. Now that's a key point, right? That's a key point that the element has only one type of atom. So if you have an oxygen atom there's only one thing and it has a mass that means it's an oxygen atom so he's the first one that states that specifically that elements have different masses and that's because the atoms have different masses now we're going to revisit this one a little bit later um, because it's got to be modified just a little bit with our current understanding atoms of one element differ in properties from atoms of all other elements so each element's unique, therefore each atom is unique, right? So an atom of oxygen is different than an atom of hydrogen. Compounds consist of 
atoms of two or more elements combined in small whole number ratios. Now this is going to link back to another set of experimental observations from before Dalton's time that we'll talk about in a second. But this gets to that idea that elements are the indivisible parts of reality and compounds are just combinations of these elements together, right? And instead of saying, ooh, we're just mixing elemental goo together, he, char he characterizes it, no, you're mixing these kind of building blocks, right? When you make water, you're not taking oxygen goo and hydrogen goo and sticking it together, you're taking pieces of oxygen, atoms of oxygen and atoms of hydrogen and combining them in a certain way, a certain ratio. And last but not least, he says that atoms are neither created or destroyed during a chemical, re during a chemical change, but are instead rearranged. And this is important because there are two laws that Dalton's atomic theory is trying to explain. Now, the second one we're going to talk about refers back to the last um, statement, but this one is referring to the law of conservation of mass. And well before Dalton, they'd known that if you'd accounted for everything in a chemical reaction, the mass of the reaction never changes, right? And again, the example here is if you're trying to make copper oxide, right? If you have a sealed vessel where you can control how much oxygen's in there and you don't have to worry about you know, gas is going in or out of the bottle, the mass of that bottle isn't going to change as that copper turns from copper to copper oxide, copper one ox or two oxide. It's just going to stay exactly the same because all that's happening is it's not things are being fundamentally altered. It's that they are being rearranged. The pieces that are there are always the same. It's just how they're connected to each other that differs. The statement we said earlier about the, the definitive small whole number proportions, that's actually an attempt to explain what was called the law of definitive proportions and multiple proportions that was discovered earlier by Proust. He didn't know why it occurred, but he knew if you measured the mass of say copper and chlorine when they reacted, you could come up with these small whole number ratios between the copper and the chlorine and as long as you had the same form of copper chloride, it was always the same. So it was something they observed, was reproducible, but didn't have an explanation for. So they gave it this name, the law of definitive proportions. But Dalton's trying to explain why the law of definitive proportions exists. Now, at the end of Dalton's theory, you've got a picture of the atom as a little ball, different masses for different elements, and different properties for different elements, but no substructure. It's just a ball. If you looked at a gold atom, it would be a gold atom ball. If you look at an oxygen atom, it would be an oxygen atom ball. Well, they quickly discovered that there were particles smaller than atoms. And this led to the idea that the atom couldn't be the smallest thing in reality the atoms had to have substructure. And the first thing that kind of led at this was experiments by Thompson with what's called a cathode ray tube. Now a cathode ray tube is basically an electron gun. So it has a very high electric voltage in the back that produces a stream of electrons that are shot out through the anode at the front. And then they go forward and they hit the front of the cathode tube, which is usually covered in some chemical that glows whenever the electrons hit it. This is actually, by the way, the basis of how old school televisions worked. Um, so if you were alive back in the 80s and 90s, you'll remember the big televisions that weighed a ton. This is how they worked. They shot an electron at the front screen and it scanned across the screen and it made pretty pictures, right? Well, Thompson is working with this and he discovers that these cathode rays, right, can actually be moved, can be altered in their flight path by electromagnetic forces. So he realizes that cathode rays are not neutral, they're charged. They're the carriers of electricity because they're flying through this high voltage electric system and they are negatively charged due to their flight path in this electromagnetic field. And so he refers to them as electrons. 
right? Because they're electrically derived and Tron just for, you know, particle type setup. So people start really getting this idea that there might be substructure inside of atoms. And so they develop this idea of, okay, well, what's the charge of an individual electron? What's the smallest charge we can get? And the guy who comes up with a great experiment to show this is Millikan, and it's called the Millikan Oil Drop Experiment. Now, it's a little complex, but not too bad. Millikan produces a very, very fine mist of oil that falls through this pinhole in the top plate of these two electric plates. Now, the top plate is positively charged and the bottom plate is negatively charged. The key point here is as the oil drops go through, an X-ray hits them. So X-rays hit them and that gives them a negative charge, right? The X-rays give them a negative charge. So then Millikan looks through this eyepiece and observes these microscopic drops of oil and adjusts the current going through those two electric plates until he can balance the oil drops and suspend them in midair. And then he's got that perfect balance between the attractive force to the top negative plate and the gravitational force coming down. And he can determine what the added charge is on top of these neutral oil drops. And so he does this for a bunch of oil drops and he gets a bunch of data. And you can see some data to the right hand side of the page. And what Millikan figures out is that all the numbers he gets are multiples of the same number. They're all multiples of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. And that's the smallest number he gets. So everything is a multiple of that number. So he's the first one to say that, okay, the smallest electric charge, the smallest negative electric charge you can get is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs, which gives a charge to this electron that Thompson had discovered. Right? So now our particle is charged. We know it exists as an individual entity because we can see it in multiples, meaning that they go in one, two, three, not as a continuum. And that leads to a discussion of, okay, so if these come out of atoms, how are atoms structured? We know atoms have to be um, electrically neutral for the most part, because most matter that we see is electrically neutral. So if there's a bunch of electrons inside of matter, which are negatively charged, that means the rest of the atom has to be positively charged. So how are they arranged? And there's two kind of competing models that were developed. On the left, you've got what's called the Thompson plum pudding model. Now, if you don't know what plum pudding is, picture of it on the left. You can also think of it kind of like raisin bread right so you got the bulk of the material the bread and that would be the positive matter and then embedded inside that are the electrons needed to cancel out that positive charge and make it electrically neutral right nagaoka develops a slightly different model kind of saturn looking model where the positive charge and the negative charge are separate and he kind of pictures it like the rings of Saturn. So the electrons are in rings around the positively charged matter. But no one knows for certain. This is an advancement upon what you had in Dalton's idea, because now you have some idea of the substructure of atoms, but it's really not that much different, right? You still got a chunk of material, a solid chunk of material forming the atom. So kind of the experiment that really takes um, nuclear structure forward is the classic experiment called Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And Rutherford decides that he's gonna probe the inner structure of the atom by blasting it with a stream of what are called alpha particles. Now alpha particles were discovered uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s through radium, you know, looks at radium. And they were found to be positively charged particles released by certain radioactive compounds. They were fairly heavy, fairly slow, so they seemed to be an ideal choice to slam into something. And so he develops a system where he shoots a stream of alpha particles at a very, very thin piece of gold, 
Now it uses gold for the reason that it's dense. So it means the atoms are very tightly packed together, meaning nothing's gonna fly between atoms. And two, gold by the way, is one of the densest elements. And two, it can be pounded and produced in very, very, very thin sheets. So he doesn't have a lot of atoms stacked on top of each other. He's just looking at a few layers of atoms and what's gonna happen when he shoots his alpha particles at them. So the experiment produces three results. The vast majority of the alpha particles fly straight through the foil. Now they don't blow a hole in the foil or anything, they just fly straight through, right? Some of them kind of swerve, you know, and go through but kind of bend off to the side. And a very, very few of them hit the foil and come back towards the radium source. And those are the ones that really got Rutherford thinking because he was like, well, wait. And he says something along the lines of, that's like shooting a 15 inch artillery shell, a piece of tissue paper, and it bounces back at you. That makes absolutely no sense. Why would they come back? And so he develops an idea of the atom based on this understanding. He says, okay, I can explain it in this way. The majority of them go straight through or through and swerve a little bit because the vast majority of atoms are nothing. They're empty space. And so the alpha particles go unimpeded straight through empty space, right? The ones that swerve and the ones that come back at us show us that the positive charge of an atom has to be very, very condensed in a very, very small area. Because what's happening is these alpha particles, which are positively charged, are being repelled by this incredibly dense positive center to the atoms, what I'm gonna call a nucleus. Now, it can only be the positive charge in this nucleus because that nucleus has to stay positively charged to repel the alpha particles. So the electrons can't be in the nucleus. They have to be somewhere outside the nucleus in that empty space. But they're so distributed that they don't effectively make that empty space occupied. And that leads to what we call the nuclear model of the atom, which we're going to discuss in the next talk.